How many of you like New Year's resolutions? That's what I thought. <laughs> I think a, a few years ago, I made a resolution that I would no longer make New Year resolutions. Um, I don't like them either, to be honest with you. But what, what, what's really neat is that with the Lord, we don't need to, to have New Year's in order to start over. We can, we can make new commitments as the Lord shows us the need for those commitments and move right into a renewed state. And, and that's the truth. But because it is New Year's, we have a tendency in this holiday to, to, to think a lot about time. And with that, we think, okay, what is, the, is there any new thing that I should be doing in this upcoming year different from last year? And so even though I personally don't like New Year's resolutions, our daughters encouraged us last night to have a dreaming session where we sat down and we actually prayerfully said, you know, Lord, what changes do you want to make in my life in the next year, 2023? And I have to admit it was valuable. It was valuable. It's, it's an opportunity for us to say, Lord, what do you want to change in my life this year? And then what I, would in, in, what I would do is encourage you to focus on the most important one spiritually and go after that. Don't try to do everything because we in, invariably fail and then we get to where we tend to be cynical about it. And No more New Year's resolutions. But may this be a day when we start Perhaps one new spiritual discipline that's going to give us greater intimacy with the Lord. Amen? Okay. What is time? We've passed from 2022, and about 10 hours ago, we jumped into 2023. Time has to do with transitions. Time has to do with seasons where we mark certain things. God himself exists outside of time. He's not limited by time. But we're very much locked into time, are we not? We know that. And so time is an important, in a sense, part of our lives as we are locked into time. The, the ultimate good news is that one day we're going to be with the Lord in eternity and we will sort of be in a timeless state eventually as we move into our eternity. But while we're on the earth, we're very much locked in. So for a very, very long time, the nation of Israel was in a season. They were in the wilderness season for 40 years. Now that's a very long time. I've entitled the message this morning, Is It Time Yet? Israel crosses the Jordan, and it very much marks a transition, and we're going to look at that. For 40 years, God had led through his servant Moses. Now Moses has died, and he's going to lead. He raises up a new leader. He always provides leadership, and it's in the form of Joshua. And in a sense, the rules don't change, but the seasons do. For 40 years, the Israelites had followed Moses' leadership. Did they do it very well? No, they really didn't. They didn't follow God, and they didn't follow Moses maybe as well as they could have. And it led to no less than three major rebellions and some rather harsh and sad judgments that came on the nation. And yet, in spite of that, God was faithful. Now Moses has died, and it's time to follow Joshua's leadership. Now, as we actually read through Joshua 3, chapters 3 and 4, um, I want us to recognize this transition. They're going from the wilderness, wanderings, you could say, and they're going to begin the time of the conquest and the actual taking possession 
of the land that God had promised their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and very recently, Moses. Now, for those of you who are old enough to, to do this exercise, think where you were 40 years ago and what your life was like. It's a long time ago, wasn't it? I was in seminary thinking that I got my whole life in front of me. Boy, that 40 years goes fast. But 40 years is a long time, and they've been wandering, and they've been waiting. And that whole earlier generation has now died, and the sons and daughters that were growing up as children at the time of the Exodus are now going to go in and take possession of the land through their sons and daughters. So, you know, they, they're going away from the time of just surviving. Now, think about that. The wilderness wanderings were a time of surviving. They needed God's guidance every day, and they got it in the form of the presence of the cloud during the day, the fire by night. He never left them. When the cloud up and moved, they knew when to go and follow the cloud. Every day they were dependent on daily food in the form of manna and water. So they were dependent on, on God really for their daily provision. It was about survival. But now they're going to transition and it's about conquest. Do you think they're, they're going to need any less faith? They're going to have to go in and conquer enemies. And the Canaanite peoples were no easy thing to deal with. They were spiritually evil, wicked, following their gods, really following Satan. They had some horrendously awful practices. And no doubt, the Israelites, if, if they think in terms of, can we do this in our own power? Not a chance. But with God, they were going to do it, and God was going to lead the way. So this was a transition. They used to be dependent on that daily manna. Soon they're going to enjoy the produce of the land of Canaan, a land that's been described as the land of milk and honey. And again, the transition from Moses, following Moses to following Joshua as they followed the Lord. Now, like Israel, as a nation, so are we as a congregation. We're in transition. So this message is relevant for us. A year ago, we were part of the Reformed Church in America. Now we're part of the Alliance of Reformed Churches. A year ago, we had $330 million, $330 million, $330,000 of debt we were a debt-heavy congregation. Now we start 2023 debt-free. That's really good news because debt is a problem, and we praise God for this. In the past, I believe that only some of our members have felt equipped, but more and more we're transitioning to wanting to equip everybody. We want to equip every single follower of Jesus with the truth of God's word, with the understanding of how to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're moving in mission. We're actually making a difference in this community. And it's going to only get better. I believe the Lord has, has, has got great things for us. So we're in transition. Uh, Pastor John is working with our consistory, and we're in transition with our structures. We're moving from kind of an old system to a more flexible understanding of what an elder and a deacon are. We're going to have administrative and care elders and administrative and care deacons, and that's going to get laid out this year. It's going to be a little different, but we're in transition. It's all very exciting, but it's also stressful because transitions can all change is a bit stressful, and so we, we need to trust God. So hear the word of the Lord, 
uh, Joshua chapter 3, and, and, and normally I ask you to stand up in honor of God's word. You can sit. <laughs> it's a long chapter. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, the Lord your God, and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Now, remember, before they were following the Lord by cloud. Now they've got a new, they're going to follow the Ark of the Covenant being carried by the priests. Because the Ark of the Covenant represents the very presence of the Lord. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. That's about 3,000 feet, folks. That's a half a mile. Why do you suppose they are getting instructions to don't get any closer to the ark of the covenant? Out of reverential fear for the Lord. Be careful to follow the instructions. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow Yahweh the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves. Get yourself purified. In, in the desert, it meant take a bath. Wash yourself up. Uh, make sure that you're, you're spiritually right before God. You know, there were certain things to consecrate themselves. Take three days to do it. It's important. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And Yahweh the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that you may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now remember, the land of Canaan is over there. You got the Jordan River blocking it. And the Jordan River is at full steam because it's, it's springtime and it's harvest time and, and the floodwaters are happening. Later on, they explain this. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of Yahweh your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. All the ites. <laughs> Understand, these are all individual people groups Canaanites is a general term, and then the specific little uh, city-states are like the Jebusites, were the people that were living in what would come to be known as Jerusalem. In those days, in Canaan, it was Jebus. So the Jebusites were the people of Jerusalem, for example. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Notice that. It's the Lord that has to lead us. We don't just decide when we go over. We wait for the Lord to go ahead of us. And it's the Lord telling Joshua, now it's time. Consecrate yourselves. Get ready. And this is what you are to do. So the Lord has told Joshua what to do because Joshua is his appointed leader. And then Joshua hears the instructions and he prophesies. He's telling the people, consecrate yourselves because in three days God's going to do great things, amazing things. He's prophesying. And that's all important because it's a sign. It's a sign to the people that when God works a miracle, then the people will know, yes, God is with us. And God is speaking to Joshua. 
and, and Joshua gives us the instructions, and we follow the lead of Joshua, and it's going to go well for us. We have to learn to hear the voice of God. And one of the greatest things you can do as a member of this congregation is pray that Pastor John, Pastor Caleb, and Pastor Jim clearly hear the voice of God. And then have the boldness to instruct you in it. And say, this is the way we need to go. Trust us because we've heard from God. That's so critical. It's going to be critical for the conquest. It was the reason the Israelites failed so badly in the wilderness is that they came to to question, does God only speak to you, Moses? God speaks to all of us. And we don't really like your leadership. Why have you brought us out here to die in the desert? In fact, we think we should stone you, get another leader, and go back to Egypt. I mean, they were talking like this. So important to understand the chain of command with God. God raises up leaders and appoints them, gives them responsibility to hear from him, The leaders need to hear and give instructions to the people, but we've got to follow. And may God give us the grace to do that. So a year ago when Pastor John says, I think the Lord wants us to be debt-free. Here's the idea. Honestly speaking, how many of you thought the Lord could do it? Good for you. You have more faith than I do. I praise God for that. And there are people that are gifted to have faith, and there are others that, well, a little bit reluctant. I don't know. And that's okay. Then we need, to, we need to encourage the people who have the gift of faith. Tell us what you believe God's going to do this year. And then we'll pray into it and join in the effort and follow. And the Lord's done it. And he's done it through faithful people in their giving, too. It it works both ways. It's like, thank you, Lord. It's something to celebrate. So it's a major accomplishment. And it's a sign that God is with us, friends. Just like the sign of what's going to happen when the priests touch the water. And that's what we're going to read about here. As soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan was at flood stage all during harvest. It's springtime. That means that the waters are flowing from Mount Hermon. They're coming down and it's It's a crazy time to cross the Jordan, humanly speaking. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from the upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away to a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. In other words, folks, this is a miracle. The water is heaped up. Adam is 15 miles north of where they are. And it just heaped up. Somebody asked me, Pastor Jim, how would that work? And you know what? I don't know. I don't know how he did it. But God clearly did it because not only did they heap up, but they went on dry ground. It was a miracle, friends. It was a supernatural act of God. As soon as they touched the water and stepped in, it stopped 15 miles north in Adam. And they went went across in dry ground. Absolute miracle. It probably wasn't as astounding as the Red Sea crossing, but it was a miracle nevertheless, undeniably so. 
The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now, I imagine there's three, four million people. It takes time. I imagine it took It took three or four hours, probably, minimally. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, Yahweh the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you are to stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of Yahweh your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them, that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of Yahweh the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Friends, it's important we have memorials so that we don't forget what God has done for us. That's why That's why we have the Lord's table. And and every month, usually the first Sunday of the month, we gather and we go through the same ritual. And, And we could have the attitude, well, it gets old. No, it's important that we remember. We need to remember what the Lord's done for us. And it's a reminder that Jesus changed everything for us by coming and offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And by his shed blood, we have life and forgiveness by his broken body. That's why we do it. Memorials are important. And these 12 memorial stones, what what God instructed is Joshua was to put them in a heap, and then whenever whenever they went over by Jericho, they see this mound of stones And the question is, what does this mean? Notice the importance here. Notice the importance that it's the parents that need to explain to the children what it means. So I want to jump down to 14 of 4. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they had stood in awe of Moses. Then Yahweh the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant law to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground Then the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. Miracle over. So I'm going to ask you, why the timing? Why do you think that when the priest stepped into the river Jordan, suddenly the miracle takes place and they go on dry ground? The presence of God. As soon as they got to the other side, done. The water returned back just as it had, the flood stage. Exactly. And we don't want to forget, we serve a God of the impossible. All things are possible with God. If God says he's going to do something, we need to believe him because he has the power to do it. But we have to believe. What would have happened had the priest said, doesn't make sense to step in a flooded river. I'm not going. If God wants me to go, he's going to have to do something here. I'm not going. No, they first have to take the step into the water. And as soon as they did, the miracle took place. 
But they had to have their faith and trust in Joshua's leadership that he heard from God. They had to obey the Lord and step into the river. And sometimes that's the challenge, isn't it? Is that we know what the Lord wants us to do, but we're afraid. We think, God, I can't do that in my own strength. I can't do that. That's a good place to be. That's where we say, Lord, I can't do it. But you can do it through me because you want me to do it and you've asked me to do it. So Holy Spirit, empower me to do it. And the Holy Spirit comes into ordinary followers of Jesus and does supernatural things through them because he can. And he loves to do it. And, and, and really, it's, it's very, very exciting. But we have to believe him for it. We have to grow in our trust. And we have to hear, learn to hear from the Holy Spirit ourselves, too, so that we can know what he wants for us. Okay, 19. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. As Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones that they had taken out of the Jordan, he said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. This is where that miracle took place. Now, we know 40 years ago, God did an incredible miracle through Moses, but that generation's gone. The Lord has now done the miracle in our generation, and the children need to know we serve a miracle working God. The memorials are important. Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For Yahweh your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had all crossed over. Yahweh the Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth will know that the hand of Yahweh the Lord is powerful. And so that you might always fear Yahweh your God. Two reasons. The memorials that we have, they tell the rest of the world, our God is powerful and nothing is too hard for him. He has the power to save us. He did through Jesus. And secondly, that we might fear him, that we might reverence him, that we'll keep him a right attitude about all of it. So, the importance of remembering. It's there. Time is moving so rapidly. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table in a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to challenge you. How many of you feel challenged by goals and and uh, setting priorities and getting things on your schedule? And Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, me too, me too. I have a tool that I use. That's why it, one of the reasons I carry this crazy thing. And they say, Pastor Jim, why do you do that? Well, habits. <laughs> in Europe, these are normal. In the United States, they're a little geeky. But it, one of the reasons I have it is because this is a, a, a Franklin Day Planner, and I'm not very digital, so I got to write stuff down. And, and in this, I have my lists and priorities and all of that. It's, it's just a tool. That's all it is. And you got to do what works for you. And I tell young people, learn to do it digitally so that you're not like me. <laughs> but the point is, it's helpful. If, if we don't set priorities, they're not going to happen. You know, we're not going to learn new habits over, overnight. We, it's only going to happen when we, de- we make a decision. This is important. Lord, I want you to help me move into this in this new year. And that's, I want to challenge you because the Bible says a lot about time and living by priorities. Um, first, 
Commit all your hopes and plans to God. Proverbs 16.3, if you can put that up. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Well, we got we to gotta do our part. Planning is good. There's a simple principle that in order to gain control over the direction of my life, I've got to gain control over the use of my time. That's really true. And we got to work at it. And we can. There's wisdom in setting specific goals and plans and laying out, okay, what's really important right now? And I want to challenge you to really ask the Lord, what's the most important? important way that I can grow spiritually this year. What discipline do you want me to develop? It might be I'm going to read the Bible through in one year. If you you read four chapters a day, you can get through it in one year. But if that's too difficult, just say I'm going to start reading the Bible through the Bible, the whole Bible, and I'll do one chapter a day. That's doable. Anybody can do that. Then in four years, you'll be through the whole Bible. I challenge you to do it. It'll change your life forever. And it's so exciting. I'm I'm telling you because I've done it, and, and, and the Lord enables me to see more and more and more. But you'll see the picture of the whole so much better if you, if you actually get a bird's eye view and, and go through the word. So I'm just going to encourage you. If you've never done it, that would be a great thing to do. But it may be that the Lord wants you to develop a greater ability to hear from the Holy Spirit so that you seek his empowerment for everything you do. Then do something towards that end. You know, join us on Thursday night for expectancy because that's what we do. It's just one way to, to do these things. Secondly, recognize the limits we do have in our planning. We need to avoid an overconfidence. Like, planning is good, but only God knows what's coming, right? That's why... He tells us in James 4, James 4, 13 through 16, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not know what will even happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boasting is evil. So I I think the Lord wants us to plan. He wants us to set goals that's all good. At the same time, we're warned, don't be presumptuous about it. It's not like we're going to gain full control of our lives by good planning. We need both. Good to make the wise plans and to go on our highest priorities, but it's foolish to ever think we're in full control. We don't know what's coming in 2023, do we? Do we? Mm -mm. But we serve the Lord God, and he does know. And we can learn to hear his voice better and follow him more closely. Amen? So, uh, the next verse is interesting, James 4, 17. Note the warning here. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. That's so true. That's convicting. Because maybe God wants you to spend more time with your family doing something that's going to spiritually build up your faith or build up the faith of your children. That's a higher priority, friends than working harder, making more money so you can buy more things that in the long run won't make any difference. We're talking about the eternal destiny of our children. And my hope and my prayer is that 
our children, and I believe God's doing something wonderful in our youth, they'll become champions of truth, champions for Jesus, because they know what they believe and what the basis of their faith is, while the rest of their peers are getting lured away by the doctrines of the world and being led to the slaughter by Satan, who is after our children. And we're living in a day and age where the enemy is after our children. And God wants to use our children to help save the children that are in greatest danger. Because we're living in very evil times, dark times. Perhaps God wants to want you to spend less time watching sports or movies and entertainment so that you can have more time to have a Bible time with your kids or to spend some time praying. Could it be that the Lord wants you to make a serious time commitment and priority to grow spiritually, to read and study God's Word, or to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Friends, it takes intention. And I know in our heart of hearts we want to do that, but it's not going to happen until we decide that it's important enough to do it. There are the application t- today is that we, we need to learn to hear from the, the Lord, follow the leadership that God appoints, do what the Lord wants us to do. We need to choose to live wisely and make the most of 2023. Amen? Ephesians, one more passage, Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, gives us a good exhortation. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And friends, today the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I want us to be aware that there's, I think there's three subtle Lies, you could say time myths or lies that Satan uses to deceive us. Here's one. Someday in the future, I'll have time. What a joke. I've lived 64 years and nine months. (laughs) The future never comes, folks. Someday in the future, I'll have time. Never happens. I assure you it won't. The second myth, doing the most important things will get easier with time. Do you find that to be the case? It's so important to teach our children the right things because you know what? As you get older, it's harder to change than when you're younger. That's the truth. By the way, do you notice that the older you get, the faster the time goes? Scary. That's the truth. Here's the third myth. We still have plenty of time. Relax, Pastor Jim. We have plenty of time. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So, friends, let's not delay. If the Lord wants us to do something, don't push it off. Make a commitment that today I'm going to start a new tradition or today I'm going to start a new habit. Today I'm going to commit to doing what the Lord wants to do in me in 2023. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, as we look 
at this story of crossing the Jordan and realizing that Israel was in transition, but you went ahead of them. You had the whole thing in control. Lord, I pray that as we move into a new year, we we are thankful that you are the God who knows what's coming. Help us, Lord, to lean into our relationship with you. Cultivate in us, Lord, the ability to better hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and give us a greater understanding of your word so that we, we know, Lord, that you are with us, that you are great and have promises for our lives, and that we can move when you tell us to go. Lord, we thank you that even though transitions can be difficult, you are with us. You are faithful. Lord, we ask that you would do in us, in each of us, all that you want to accomplish in our lives and help us to take that necessary first step, just like the priests who stepped into the Jordan River, and then you produce a miracle. And it's a sign, Lord, that you will be with them in the conquest. And Father, you don't want us just to survive. You want us to thrive in Jesus. So we pray that this year we would, as a congregation and as a individual members of this body. In Jesus' name, amen.